Hannah, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to dive into your story. Again, we met on Instagram, as with most of my people here, and you had responded to one of the questions that I put up and it said, and I want to state it right here. It says, confidence as athletes does not equate to self-worth as humans. Tell me about your story. What does that mean to you now in this stage of life? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's taken me a while to kind of unpack a lot of this. Um, and this was like a recent realization. And when I saw the work you're doing and some of the messages you're sharing, it just kind of reminded me of like how important that is. But I grew up playing basketball my whole life. Um, I played for the Canadian women's national team. I played in the States and went through all of those experiences. Um, and it was just like always my dream as a kid to to play on our Olympic team, to play on our national team. So everything I did in my life was driven around that. I was as confident as could be on the court. I showed up with myself every day. I worked hard. I, I was really confident in who I could be. Um, but I still struggled and I still struggled off the court. Um, I experienced some really um really challenging mental health problems when I was in college I was diagnosed with an eating disorder and was just so hyper focused on sport that I wasn't able to see these bigger pictures um and kind of fast forward I decided um in my last year of college which was also 2021 so kind of like prime COVID um as a Canadian kid I couldn't go back home my parents couldn't come for graduation so was really just hit with like everything at once um but now looking back I just I realized that it forced me to like stop and see that there's so much more outside of the game and that like in the blink of an eye, our sport that we tie most of our lives to can be gone. And as scary as that sounds, like we just, we don't really think about that as athletes, especially when we're hyper-focused. Um, and so, yeah, the past kind of three years, I've really just been untangling what what sport has done for me and the lessons I've learned um, and just kind of talking to a lot of athletes, people like yourself and people who have these like similar struggles. And I'm like, why does, why do all of these athletes who are so confident on the court come off or on their playing fields, come off and experience imposter syndrome and experience self-doubt, fear, anxiety, like all of these things when they're just, they're built to be such successful humans. And it kind of just came back to that. I was sharing with you, I, I saw a podcast and a woman who was, um, like a head of a CEO at a billion dollar company was sitting down with Oprah. And after that, she realized that like she lacked self-worth. And she said in her podcast, she's like, I never knew the difference between confidence and self-worth until I had this kind of realization. And so that was like a, a light bulb for me too. Um, yeah. So I saw one of your posts and was like, yes, like she gets it. We get it. So I'm just and I'm doing my thing. <laughs> I love that. And it's so fun to find others that get it, right? It like lights you up even more yeah. about what you are going through and what you're realizing on your end. It's like, okay, wait, I'm not the only one. Like, let's keep doing this thing. And um, it's so interesting that you mentioned the the CEO of a billion dollar company, somebody who you would look at similar to, say, you know, your Kobe Bryant's, your LeBron James, your all those people who are so, quote, successful. Mm -hmm. And you really have to sit back and say, what does success mean to those people? Do they actually feel successful? They could be the greatest of all time, but do they feel like the greatest of all time? And it's so important to separate the two. So mm -hmm. what does that look like in your life now that you've had this revelation? What what are some things you're untangling right now? Yeah, so I, I'm very lucky to still be able to work in sport just at the community level now. So I work at a nonprofit in Toronto um, and we're like delivering cost-free basketball across um, a bunch of different neighborhood improvement areas in Toronto. So it's I'm very lucky to still be in this environment. But there was still something missing. And I'm like, I am everyone I would talk to was like, wow, you have like, no one believes that you're you can really like continue to feel your passion in sport after you stop playing and i was like i'm doing that like i am able to like, work in the community work in kind of some like partnerships and other stuff and i still was missing something and i just couldn't figure out what it was i'm like why am i nervous in these spaces why do i not feel like i belong in other spaces and another like really good friend of mine actually from buffalo um who was on the track team he he said to me one time um i was like we were having these similar conversations and he was like do you 
do you ever think about how we like nurtured this athlete our whole life, but we never, nobody ever nurtured the human outside of the athlete. And then we get to our careers after and all of those things that weren't nurtured as human beings who were, there are the things that were as athletes are exposed. And that's what really started to like open my eyes to those areas. So it was a lot of hard work to like look internally and being be like, what is going on and how do I fix this? And just kind of like make a mess of all of the experiences I had. But it was really eye opening to me to be like, that's so true. We just never, it's not our fault. It's nobody's re- like fault, but I think it's like something that we can do better moving forward with athletes, um, just really nurturing those other parts of them. Yeah. And it's, I know you mentioned before this, that there's a lot of movement in this space, right? People are talking a little bit more about mental health. And Mm -hmm. you had mentioned that you came out with your story when you were a sophomore in college, when no one, A, you're 20 years old at that point. B, nobody was really talking about mental health and their stories and the way that you mentioned that it was in the middle of what you were going through. Touch on that and touch on the reaction that you got from other people and how you think that might change nowadays. Yeah, um, that was that was a really a really confusing, eye opening time for me. Um, but as a freshman in college, who was really never struggling, I never struggled with my mental health my whole life. Before realizing and untangling, now there was ways that I acted as an athlete that a lot really like added to my struggles. Um, but I think my biggest why behind me going public with my story and just wanting other people to know what I was going through is I had a platform as an athlete. We were really, uh, we had a great season. Um, so this platform was just something on my spirit was like, this is the time to be able to make an impactful difference that people don't want to talk about. And I think like people can talk about their careers and their struggles when they've retired because I think it's easier and there's no shame on that. I think that's a beautiful thing too of storytelling is just such a healing thing for people. But what about the athlete? Like if we want to make a difference for athletes who are currently going through mental struggles, like there needs to be representation of you can do, you can be both. Like you're going to go through this and you can also be a successful athlete. How do we do it? It's going to be different for everybody. But I think just having that like someone to put words to what someone else is feeling at that time in that vulnerable, challenging space is like, that was my goal with it. And I think it it did a lot of that. So many people in my life, so many people in my own college environment, but from across the country were like, this is exactly what I was going through. And I had no idea. And so like, I just kind of looked back and was like, what did I wish I knew? Like, what did I wish I saw when I was in the like, in the thick of my struggles? And it was exactly that because I just didn't know. It was not something that was talked about. Eating disorders in sport are talked about a little bit more in some sports than others, but definitely not in basketball. Definitely not in sports like football and soccer, like a little bit. But I mean, besides the point, but I just think like it happens everywhere. And so for me, it was just trying to, break down some of those uncomfortable conversations. Um, And there was there was some hate. There was some backlash of like, you're still sick. Like, why are you doing this? Like, you need to focus on you. And I was like, or this could be something that helps me kind of understand and unpack and relate to other people, which it did a lot. So, yeah, I think with everything, you get a little bit of a little bit of backlash from people, but it was still something that was special. Yeah. And I like the way you mentioned that it could be both, right? You can still be going through something and be healing and a successful athlete and perform and do all of the things. Those feelings are able to coexist. And I think that is what's confusing to a lot of people is we can we can be hurting and be happy at the same time. And how do we how do we put those on paper, right? Like you were saying, like, how do I compartmentalize this in my head? Mm-hmm. And and it's really tough. So being able to talk about your story, even just talk it out, whether you're talking about it on a public platform or just, I don't know, you could be talking to a brick wall, but being able to speak the things, actually hear what's going on in your head, because I think we're just, we can our head can go at a million miles a minute. Yeah. So slowing down, whether it's journaling, talking, and really 
getting clarity on what's going on is so big. It's yeah. So big. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said about the journaling and the, the just taking a time to like understand what goes on in your head. Cause like, if you don't create that time, it's just going to keep existing. And I think like, that's why so many people, not the sole reason, but so many people just can't put a pin on why they're struggling, but we just keep going at a hundred miles an hour. Like if you don't hit the brakes and stop to take time to understand what's going on, like it's, it's almost impossible. Right. So it's really just taking the time to do the, to make a mess of everything and then try and tidy it back up. I think we, we don't ever want to make a mess of it. We just want to like keep rolling and keep it clean as athletes and just keep focused on our goals, but it can just kind of take us in the wrong direction. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting and I don't know, this analogy came to me while you were saying that you need to like unpack it and then, you know, gain clarity and stuff like that is, you know, a garage, how mm -hmm. a garage just ends up just there's oh one thing goes in there and then it's a bike and then it's this and that. And next thing you know, the entire garage is filled and you have one walkway to get to the door. This is like our head, right? Yes. It's, it's one thing happens. Oh, okay. That's all right. All right. And then the next thing happens. Oh, I had that thought again about the food. Oh, it's okay. I'll deal with that later. Um, you know, and then how you have to get that garage cleared out is take everything out. Yeah. Go through it. What do you need? What do you not need? What serves you? What doesn't serve you in this season of life? And then put it all back together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we get scared. It's hard when you're taking everything out to even think about how you're going to put it back together. And I feel like so many people and for like two years post college, I was like, I, I still just felt like I was in this place of like a messy garage because it's hard to see like, how is this going to get put back together? But then slowly you start to kind of like see those pieces get put back together. But it's hard because people stop before that happens and they're like, ah, this isn't working. Like, I can't keep doing this. It's not working. So it's just really sticking to it and being willing to, I guess, face the ugly side of things and face some of those things that caused you challenges to see that light. But it's hard. It's hard for sure. There's no way around it. Yeah. Where are you finding that self-worth right now? And what does, quote, self-worth mean to you? Yeah, I think what I've learned and what I'm still learning is that, one, it's it's ever-changing. Um, and two, it's just going back to the, like, really simple, like, things of who I am as a person. And I actually had to do a lot of, like, inner child's work to figure out who that was. Because before... I was an athlete. I was like, why did I fall in love with sport in the first place? Like, why did I fall in love? And then it's like, well, I actually didn't know anything about sports, but I loved that I could run around on a field with my friends and feel like I belonged in a place and I was super competitive. So in a, a classroom environment, my competitiveness was like, don't do that. But then on the field, it's like, this is amazing. We love it. So I think just like, I love belonging and I love finding meaning and connection to people. And so it's stuff like this now where I'm like, this is what I need to be doing. I need to be helping with that. And then the, I was like, when I was telling you the organization I'm working in now, just where we do research to practice work. So it's a lot about creating spaces for belonging for kids through sport, um, not about high performance, which is the opposite of what I've ever done my whole life. But now I'm able to like find meaning in it. Um, so yeah, it's, it was kind of just going back to why I fell in love with sport in the first place and really thinking about it because it took me a little bit to understand. It wasn't because I wanted to be on a national team or go to the WNBA, like that maybe was my first thought, but that's not why we all fall in love with sport, right? There's something at like a very basic time um, that kind of allowed me now to keep connecting those dots. Um, and even if I don't keep working in sport, I think that's the stuff I can still continue to build my worth off of. It's not about confidence. It's about, do I see myself in these spaces? Am I confident that I'm worthy of being in those spaces rather than in my confidence in the spaces. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And that is such a big difference in, in what you said, right? I can be confident about, I was saying before this is like, I can be confident in telling somebody how to set up a podcast and I can be confident that I have a podcast. I know what I'm talking about, but do I feel worthy of having a big podcast? 
do I feel worthy of achieving these things or whatever that may look like? And that's completely different. And that's still something I work on on a daily basis. And I want to just hone in on that, that it is an ongoing journey. It is not a destination. You don't have a goal of finding self-worth. It is an ongoing journey because things happen. Life changes. I be, you become new at something and then all of a sudden, you know, you have to gain up your confidence in that again. And still, do you feel worthy of being good at that? If you were to f- talk to somebody now and or some of the athletes that you're working with, what are what are some action items you would give to them to gain self-worth? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. And I'm just trying to do a little bit more of that now. So it's it's good that we're talking about it. But I think the main thing is just going back to kind of what I was saying about how I found it myself. Like we talk so much about like what athletes are good at on the court. And if we create positive environments for athletes to grow as humans and nurture them as humans, they're going to be good on the court. Relationships, success and, and confidence and our ability to perform is all about feeling like we belong in those spaces, feeling like a coach believes in us and that's based on relationships. So if we build that it's going to come what we don't do often enough and what I'm trying to do a little bit more now is like what I ask myself like why do you love this sport like why are you here what you know what I mean what makes you want to show up and it could be as simple as I love moving my body and that's great because that is going to create a healthy person for life right so like building on that or I love connecting with my teammates I love a space where I can be a leader and like nurturing those things and helping athletes just recognize them. You don't have to like have an answer. You're like, well, you're going to be a CEO one day. Like, no, but that's awesome that you love being a leader. Like keep using that. It's going to get hard. There's going to be times when your teammates don't like you because you have to be the one to call out the stuff on culture and whatnot, but keep doing it. Like nurturing those things that aren't performance-based um, are just so important. And even like we just focus so much on what an athlete's body can do instead of, or sorry, what an athlete's body looks like doing it instead of what it can do and how special that is and stuff like that. So I think it's just like really rewiring the way that we, we talk about what makes athletes special because I think they get a good platform, but they don't necessarily know how to use it. Um, so yeah. Oh, that's so big. They get a good big platform, but they don't know how to use it. Yeah. And as far as unwinding that and rewiring what, you know, what sport culture has embedded in us, that's a process as well in itself. So things like this podcast, things like other platforms that talk about the whole human, I highly suggest. What mm-hmm. has been, um, what's been one of the, one of the big things that you're unwiring right now and how have you noticed it shifting in your life? This is a good one. Um, yeah, I, I would say, so the biggest thing, and this is actually something that really caught my eye with you and what you do, because I saw a lot of your running stuff. And that's what I think our algorithm put us together in that place. But I, I, my like main thing coming out of sport was my just negative relationship with exercise because I was so like hyper-focused. One of my biggest things that caused my, my struggles was I was like very performance based. I was over exercising, over training because I just always had this more and more and more belief instead of like smarter training, less is more. Um, And that took three years post sport to untangle. And it wouldn't it was not until this year that I really started to get it. And I got that through running. I always loved to run um, before, but it was more just because I was good at it and I could run fast. But I couldn't actually run for longer than like 5K or something like that because I was always just like hard, hard, hard. Like it has to be so hard that I'm dying when I'm done and just slowing down. And like running is the most basic movement you learn as a kid. It's like, okay, I learned to walk or I learned to crawl and I learned to walk. And now all of a sudden I can speed it up and I can run. And slow running and just like understanding this like really basic movement was so like therapeutic for me. I was like, this is what movement like these are the benefits of movement. Like this is what it feels like. And so I think the past like year, one of the biggest things that I've untangled and still there's some stuff I'm working through, but just movement and the positive benefits of it because it gets so distorted as athletes um, in training mindsets and everything is about success. So finding success in the things that aren't um, 
like win or lose space. Um, so yeah, I think that was like my biggest thing for this past while, but I think there'll be some more untangling as we go. Yeah. Yeah. And that all or nothing mentality, that performance, right? We focus so heavily on numbers and yeah, uh, that's why I recently posted, I've had not been wearing my Apple Watch for a very long time, so much that I lost my tan line that I used to have <laughs> to, with yeah. my Apple Watch. I just found myself at the end of the day wondering, like, how many calories did I burn? And, like, basing everything off of these numbers. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that these numbers are not helpful in some way. Say you're doing specific training for an event or whatever, and you need to look at your pace or you have a specific goal and all of that. The biggest thing is your relationship with it and understanding your relationship with it. So for me in this season of life, it just was better to take it away. And it's great. Maybe eventually I'll put it back on and I won't feel guilty about that or feel like I failed or feel like I can't believe I changed my mind. But it's when my relationship with it is going to be better. Yeah. Yeah. I think you I saw your on post that on that. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah think it's, you can. yeah. It's, um, it's interesting. It's so interesting. Cause I think like that was the struggle when I started, like just kind of getting more into running and just, I mean, you know, this because once you really start training, like you can't just go hard all the time. You're going to be injured after a week. You can't just run, you know, the fastest pace you've ever run and forcing myself to like slow down and understand that allowed me to like see that switch of this is not even about those numbers like this is really just like this is so positive in the way that it feels to be disconnected from like external things and just really connected to yourself because I think like what you said we get so hyper focused on like what's on our watches what's on our phones like what's kind of like the metrics that we can then share with other people that we don't ever get to like benefit from like one of the best things about being human is movement like you can it's just it's such a beautiful thing so I think like we get distracted by so many things and like you said there's a lot of positive benefits of them too but not being able to ever pull away from them is a challenge uh, and yeah I think that's like a that's an important one to touch on I don't think very many people talk about the the hyper fixation over a lot of like those the watches and stuff like that yeah, the metrics. And, mm -hmm. and you know, in sport, it's becoming more and more prominent, right? They're able to, oh my gosh, put a heart rate monitor on you. And just like, as for me, us in the pool, it was not very tech at all. Yeah. There's no tech involved in swimming. Yeah. And so now there's a lot coming out where it's all numbers, right? And, mm -hmm. and in swimming and in sport, that serves you. You have a specific goal, your specific training, and that serves you. But outside of sport, when you're talking about moving for the rest of your life, completely different story. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. And I think like, I just, what, as you say that, I just think of like the times I've had conversations with people and they're like, okay, like that was not really a great workout because my watch didn't close all its rings. I'm like, well, if you took your watch off, and had a great time with your friends and you moved together and stuff like I'm sure it would have been such a more positive experience. So I think it's tough. And to your point, too, like the, the metrics and the science around sports is so great now. But I do worry. Again, I worry about what is that setting up for people post sport? Like, what are we disconnecting them from? And how does it feel to play instead of this is what you did while you played um, and stuff like that? So, yeah, yeah, the performance anxiety and all of those things that come into play and it's a lot to unpack. And I think either way, there's always going to be something for an athlete to unwind once they okay. get out of sport, because th there's, there's just always something, whether it's your relationship with movement or not having structure or not having a community. There's a lot of things that go into it. And I think that's what I've learned so much about being in this space is that there's layers that we need to do so yes <laughs> yes yes um, but the goal is to just gain that self-awareness for what are the layers because we don't know sometimes what we're missing and to have somebody on the outside say it for you and be like oh that's it 
yeah. revelation you had listening to the podcast. Like, oh, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's it's like healing and growth and all of that. Like it's sometimes it's a lot more simple than we think. And I think we just like everyone's like, do I need therapy? Do I need this? Do I need that? Like, yes, all great things. But sometimes like it's so simple. Like the concepts are really simple and it's like a lot of inner reflection, which is hard. That's the hard part, but the stuff is out there for sure. Yeah. What are you working on now that you are super excited about? And I guess how best can we support that? Um, I honestly, this, like, I, I think for a while, um, as I transitioned out of sport into the work world, definitely get back into those like hardcore perfectionist tendencies that us athletes tend to have when we're in these new spaces of like, go, go, go. How do I, you know, be the best I can. Um, so for a while it was really just like, had to learn a few lessons in the workspace and realize it was really connected to sport. But then once I did, I was able to kind of like find value in those small things again. Um, and now I'm just like really trying to, after doing that internal work, now I'm just trying to share it and, you know, have my voice as much as I can create space. Uh, we hear a lot from a lot of people now, like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. And like, the reality is, especially with the culture, the work culture we're in, like, there's never not going to be work. And so my like really big focus right now is just like, I only don't have time for it when I don't make the time for it. So just creating space for these conversations, creating space for, you know, sharing content, sharing the lessons that you learned, having hard conversations, um, and then just doing my best to to share with athletes who are going through it now. Cause I think that's my biggest goal is whatever I went through, how can you like, even if it's one person, how can you help one person not go through that same thing that you went through? It's like, that's how we see growth. That's how we see changes in these like systems that we talk about are really can be damaging or can be hard for athletes. Um, so I think just sharing as much as I can. Yes. And it's so true when you talk about time and right, we had everything just planned out for us in sports we didn't really have to create our own schedule it was just basically created for us Mm -hmm. and so getting outside and learning to create that structure and prioritize not correctly but prioritize in the way that serves you best is so big and it's so hard and it's so hard and it's something I'm totally learning right now more as a new mom is like okay is this productive? Is that, you know, we, we, you mentioned work society and the way that we are just like, go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. They, the mist of like what productivity compared to like what passion is and, and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy. And I cannot even begin to imagine as a new mom as well, because then all your priorities change. Right. So I think just reprioritizing is something that like all athletes have to learn to do because we, we're so, like you said, we're so scheduled and so set our whole lives. Like you almost have to completely relearn those things. So yes. If you were to talk with somebody who's transitioning right now, right? It's May and people have just left sports and they just graduated or whatever that looks like. What's at least your top action item to that person who's about to retire? I would say, again, like this has just been so eye opening for me lately. So just going back to that point of like revisiting why you played sport in the first place um, and just it takes work. Like I think really diving into that why and then trying to find ways that you can keep filling that passion is where we can really find that self-worth. And then just another thing is I think you actually I saw something on your page that did a really good job explaining this was just tapping into the things that we learn that are invaluable, like really just the lessons that we learn as athletes are, are unbelievable. And I think we get so caught up in like resume building and stuff like that when a lot of the time, like that next step is really just going to be a connection of some of the experiences that you have in sport. Um, and just like owning that as people, whether it's your confidence, your ability to work on a team, things that you can't teach without experience. Um, those were my biggest, like, kind of pieces of advice for people transitioning. It took me a while to figure that out myself, but I had a couple of people who passed that down to me and it just helped me tremendously to like see myself in a bigger in bigger shoes than I did um, outside of my athlete identity. So yeah, that is so big. And it's it ties into something I'm working on right now as far as like 
just helping athletes realize the advantage they have outside of sports and how to get to that point. Um, because I think the one post that you're talking about is, you know, you don't have any work experience, but you have mm -hmm. yep. coachability, you have time management, you have all of these actual traits that you said can't be taught. They exactly. just happen. There are experiences that you went through. And um, I think the coachability aspect is just so huge because yeah. nowadays we're in an environment where don't hurt my feelings. Don't, you know, it, it can be very, uh, don't coach me. Don't give feedback, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just seen as negative, but it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need yeah. to be. Yeah. 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 So, well, thank you so much for this time and this space and sharing your story and just being here. Um, I, I hope anybody that gets value out of this, please reach out to Hannah. She is just a star of a human and I appreciate you. Thank you. And I could say all the same. And it's been so inspiring seeing you. And on top of all of the stuff you share as an athlete, like sharing as a mom is really, really special. And I don't think anyone can truly understand that until they are a mom, but it's so inspiring for all of us. So thank you for having me and creating this, this platform. Thank you, Hannah.